Good afternoon. Um, hi. Hi. I'm here today with um, former Representative Roy Reinard, who represented the 178th district, which was consisted of Bucks County, from the years 1983 to 2002. Thank you for being with us here today. Thank you. Uh, could you please start off by describing your family background for us? Sure. I um, went to Westchester College, now university, and uh, when I got out, I always had an interest in being in politics. I was a political science major, but our family had a, at that time, second generation insurance company, which uh, I went into after I graduated from school, but I always had an interest in politics and ran for a local office in my township and uh, got elected to that, and that spring, springboarded me to where we are today. Uh, but I've been an active insurance agent for the last 27 years and all during my time in the legislature, which kind of made me uh, a little bit unique. There were only a handful of us that actually did more than one thing. And uh, coming from the community I represent, I thought it was a real important thing to be a citizen legislature. And, and that's basically the course I took, and, and I think it helped me well. You talked about your family business. Was anyone in your family active in politics? Actually, it was. My uh, great-grandfather uh, was actually wasn't born, but he moved to uh, Arizona when the uh, trains were making their way west, and he settled in Tombstone, Arizona, and he actually got elected in local politics in Tombstone, was elected mayor in the uh, late, late 1800s, and uh, actually then was, uh, when Arizona was becoming a, from a territory to a new state, got elected to the Arizona legislature when it first became a state and uh, represented the southern part of Tucson, or southern part of Arizona there. And uh, I didn't even know about it until about 10 years into my service when my grandmother just, as a matter of fact, mentioned, oh, my father was a member. And so when I heard that, then I contacted the, uh, the state of Arizona and got a hold of all their records that they had on his name and got a number of pieces of legislation that he had dealt with and worked through. So it was, it was kind of neat to share it. And I've been out to Arizona a number of times. My parents have a house out there currently, and my sister lives out there with her family. And been to Tomb Tombstone, where he's buried, and uh, in the courthouse where he worked. And they still have a whole bunch of, uh, of his memorabilia around. And they actually uh, have a parade every year in Tombstone called El Dorado. And it was a parade that he actually started. And it's a uh, period of time where all the locals, uh, the men won't uh, shave for a period of like 60 days and they go back to their scruffy days uh, out on the range. So it's kind of neat. Why did you decide to become a Republican? Uh, basically, uh, there was, when I was at Westchester, I had to register the vote. I was 18 at that time. It was a, it was a tough time when I first, I was actually turning 18 because when I was a freshman in college, the Vietnam War was still going on. And uh, it was, you know, it was at that time in 72, uh, the tide was pretty much anti-war in the country at that point. And uh, a local professor from Westchester was uh, running for uh, a local office and I uh, wanted to make sure I could vote for him. And it was time to register and so I registered Republican, helped out my local professor and uh, you know, from then on, took it back home and uh, got involved politically in my own area where I grew up and took it from there. Was there any reason why you ran for the House the first time? Well, when I was in college, I could never understand why anyone would run for an office that was two years when you could run for one that was six. For instance, the U.S. Senate versus Congress. I could never understand why anybody would want to be a member of Congress when you could be a member of the Senate. So what do I do? I run for a two-year office and uh, run I have 14 elections between the 20 years that I served between generals and primaries. So, uh, but you know, it, politics is an interesting thing. The term of office in the House being two years keeps you really close to your constituents in your district. You're always, you're always running. You're always uh, active. You're always out, and uh, you can't really get too complacent. So it's it's a nice part of a uh, if there is a good part of a of a short term. That is one good thing about it. Mm -hmm. I think the first time you ran, your House seat was redistricted. That's correct. Um, back in 1980, when they did the census nationwide, they realized that obviously, which is a continuing trend in Philadelphia moving out to the suburbs, and Bucks County's population had grown s significantly enough that in 80 they created a new legislative district 
Uh, that was the seat that I ran for. I had uh, a three-way primary, and then I had to win a general election. And uh, I was the new guy. I was uh, the, the party was looking, local Republican Party was looking for someone young and someone that was new. And because most of the people in the area that I represent were new residents, uh, they had just moved there in a number of early number of years. I was a median age, roughly, of that. And they were looking for somebody that would really grow with that area. And um, so that first election was in 1982 and uh, made me the first legislator for the 178th district. Well, what did you think of your first campaign? It was a lot different than the campaigns you see now. Um, and I guess anybody you speak to and they look backwards and say things have been different then. But things clearly were different when it comes to how you communicate. Um, there were no personal computers at that time. Uh, there were no cell phones at that time. Uh, so realistically, if you saw someone either at a meeting or someone came to your office or someone would have to actually pick up the phone and call you or, or, or send you mail, you, when you ran your campaigns, you didn't have the kind of dollars you see in, in, in elections, even local elections today. Uh, there weren't media consultants and things a lot along those lines on our levels. No one could afford to do mass mailings and commercials. So these things were more like stuffers and door-to-door -door and uh, hoofing it type of campaigns. And uh, the early campaigns were like that. And as the years went on, you know, it was sad to see a lot of that leave because it was much more convenient than to use a consultant and, and to use a mailing house that could get your information out. And the downside of that is all the people that were individually there to support you, it would lick labels, put on, you know, address envelopes to hand address them because, again, we couldn't, couldn't mass media it. Um, you know, that, that kept a lot of people together. And uh, as campaigns move away from that, you know, that, that touch is a little bit gone. But it was a quieter and a more gentler times in politics, both nationally as well as locally. Did anyone help you, um, say, give you the, show you the ropes as you were starting the campaign? There were a lot. The whole learning curve was everybody that was involved. But uh, I had, just like almost anybody that uh, has a mentor of some sort, there were two people that were very key in, uh, one, getting me to run. When, when it, the party, I was saying, looking for a candidate uh, to get their endorsement, um, actually there was a woman that they really wanted who was involved locally and uh, already you know, had a, a, a little base, a, a political base, and, and an interest in school board issues and stuff along those lines. And um, she had two young sons and couldn't do it. So uh, then there was a township supervisor who uh, also was, was that way, but also had young children and, and really couldn't do it. So it dropped to me in third. And uh, so I always liked the number three. It's always worked out well. Did anyone from your family get involved in your campaigns? We were all novices, but everybody in my, everybody in my family from you know, my sisters to my mother and father, or my aunt, my uncle, my cousins, all in those very first campaigns all put a lot of effort into it. They would go to our little tiny campaign headquarters and help, you know, hand address things. They would, uh, you know, go to, you know, malls and supermarkets and things like that to help me hand out things. Uh, they were always good with contributions. And, uh, you know, as that went away, as far as our work, and, and actually hand doing the campaigns, they were always there all the way through it. And it was, always served as a good base for me. And uh, it's great to have your family around you. In your own words, could you describe the 178th district, specifically the people and their issues when you served? It's, it's, a, it's a very small area in Pennsylvania. Roughly 65,000 people are in a house district. In some areas, that's a county or two. In Bucks County with, uh, you know, I guess over 600,000 people. Uh, my district was very small. It was very condensed. It was only about five minutes long by 10 minutes, you know, wide the other direction, and uh, it was really only one municipality and a piece of like four others. I didn't have any school districts in total. I had a pieces of three, and so it was it was great that way because I could get anywhere and basically be in my neighborhood. Uh, but it was also had a downside because if somebody wanted to campaign against you, they could put 20 road signs out and they'll be a household name instantly. Uh, th there was just a very condensed, tight district. It was all suburban. It was, it was all residential. I don't have any cities, towns, boroughs, 
any main streets, anything along that way. It's basically from an aerial shot looking down, it's just a giant um, residential development area. In fact, uh, I d don't even have apartments in my legislative district, so it's all owner-occupied, single family, and there's some townhouse uh, later on. But it's all, you know, just a very condensed little area, and it's a beautiful part of Ox County. What was the political makeup of your district? The political makeup was uh, solidly Republican when I got elected, and as more people moved from the city into uh, our area, because our area bordered right along you know, the border of Philadelphia, um, it became more and more mixed. You would get a lot more independent voters coming in. You would get a lot more Democrats moving up. A lot of the Democrats would convert to Republican because the county is Republican controlled and been that way for a lot of years. But it, clearly the, the mix had changed over time and the current legislative district has again been changed a number of times with reapportionment, but the new one actually is larger in geography than it was. and. Uh, you know, the mix has gotten a lot closer to, uh, you know, it's certainly not 50-50, but the, the district is not the 75-25 uh, Republican it was when I first got elected. Do you feel that you effectively reached the goal of serving your constituents whenever you were a member? I do. I, you know, again, I, I always liked the fact that I did something else. I, I had always whenever I had an opportunity to speak for a group, I would always say Pennsylvania really should be a citizen legislature much like most of the country. The majority of the states in the Union, the legislature meets only a few months of the year. Uh, most of the people and obviously can't afford to do that full time and so they have other occupations. And Pennsylvania is only a handful of states that actually meets on a year-round basis much like the way your kids are in school. When they're in school we're in session, when they're off in the summer we're off, when they're off for holidays we're off. And uh, I, I I think having a citizen legislature, it, would, it keeps you much more grounded to what's really going on. And everybody comes here when they first get elected really being grounded and knowing. But as time wears on and you can serve here decades or two or three, uh, you kind of lose a little bit of that. And for me, it, it was always, you know, when we were in session, I was here. When we weren't, I was back working just like everybody else in my legislative district was. So I think it served me pretty well after first being elected to the House and coming to Harrisburg. Was there anything that surprised you? Pretty much everything. Um, I was, I grew up in, in the area that I live, that I represented. I've been there pretty much most of my life. I've moved between, you know, the house I was born in to the house that I'm actually in now, residing in, and they're, they were all short little lateral moves to get to there. It wasn't very long as far as geographic distance goes. And the big thing, when you come from the southeast, uh, if you don't travel extensively in Pennsylvania, you just think that that's the way it is everywhere else. And uh, once you pass where we live in, in Bucks, when you're in that Philadelphia, Bucks, Montgomery, Delaware, Chester County area, once you pass Valley Forge heading west on the turnpike, things change. And uh, there were far more farms then than there are today, but there still are extensively a number of farming, agricultural interests that, you know, I had no real interest, not interest, but I had real no, no knowledge, prior knowledge about that. Certainly had never been to a strip mine. Uh, didn't know about uh, the different types of just construction homes. Uh, back where, again, back where when I got elected, uh, the salary in the legislature was just increased up to 25000 There were people in my street that had cars worth more than that. So that was really a big change. And, and you know, our led, where I represent the people's homes were, were expensive. They had large mortgages. And you would come out here and you could see the cost of what new housing was. And it was radically different. And then again, as you go in the northeast or northwest of the part of the state, again, it changes. There really aren't any big cities around. And even the, the cities that are in Pennsylvania were nothing like the city I was used to with Philadelphia. What did you think of the process on the House floor of voting and just being down there in the mix of it all? Um, I, was, I wasn't really an advocate of the way it was done. I, I actually like, I like order and I like to have, I know like if I'm scheduled to be here, I like to have business being worked on and, and if not, you know, then let me, let me go do something else. I, I just hate sitting around wasting time. And the whole legislative process is just seems to be built around delays and even if it's not necessarily on purpose, but the delays happen and the stalling happens. You're, I, I like the way Washington does it much better. I like when you're going to have a vote that you have a, a scheduled time you can vote. 
Uh, you have a period of time that you can cast your vote, and then you can go back to doing what you want. Um, for instance, on the floor of the House, we go in, we'll go into a caucus, we'll talk about bills, Republicans will meet, Democrats will meet. Very few of us leave the caucus not knowing the way we intend to vote on the floor. Debate could last for hours and hours, and the same things are being said over and over again. To me, just sitting through that hour after hour is a, is a, is a true waste of, of time and effort. And uh, I would much rather know that I can go or I can come back at uh, a scheduled time and cast my vote. Because my voting was important to me, and I always had uh, around a 98% plus uh, atten attendance and voting record over a 20-year span. So, I mean, it was important for me to be there, and I did, but I just, the process could really be enhanced. Could you describe your first office? My first office uh, was actually in the building that we're in right now. This building they call the Ryan Building back then. It wasn't, obviously. And uh, it was in bad repair. You know, when you're a freshman member, you, you get the, what's left. Uh, everybody above you gets their, their pick of where they want to be. This place uh, had many broken windows. It had, besides us inhabiting it, had uh, pigeons and squirrels. And it was not unusual at all to walk in and find a squirrel running around. And, you know, the birds, you just had to make sure that uh, when they were doing things, you, you had to be careful where they were. Uh, it was drafty. It was cold. The heat didn't work. And it was, it was a shame because this uh, at one time was envisioned to be, you know, where the governor was going to have his, his, his offices. And uh, there was just long delay in getting this building moving along. So uh, we occupied it for, I had two offices in here. The first office was on the first floor and I realized the birds, I'm better off getting higher ground. So I moved up to a second floor office when I got reelected the following year. And then more offices were made available later in the complex, and we were able to move out of this building. And ultimately, they restored it, did a great job with it, and named it after a, a prominent speaker uh, and a, actually a, a guy who uh, it was different eras, but Matt Ryan and I had uh, one interesting thing in common that no one else in the legislature, House and Senate had. We were both lifeguards in Ocean City on the beach patrol. And uh, so we would always kid each other about that. and. Uh, it, it, it was a good, good starting ground for us to come up and deal with all these people because uh, we, we thought keeping people in control on the beach was a difficult thing to do. That was nothing. <laughs> Could you describe your district offices? Have you always had a district office? I always did. Uh, I, I got elected just when the legislature was starting to become more professional and uh, district offices were starting to become, you know, kind of an important thing so people had a local way to get a hold of you, especially when you're over two hours away. I had, you know, over the time I was here, very few people just happened to stop into the Capitol. It's, uh, you got to go out of your way to do it. I did, you know, every time I got an opportunity to speak before people, I told them how beautiful the state Capitol is and why they should be here. And uh, the history of the floor of the state Capitol is Mercer Tiles, which is from my home county of Bucks. And um, so it was, it was interesting to, to, to have them up, bring groups up. But again, school trips are always difficult because of liability reasons. So. Not as many schools and not as many kids got to get up here as I think should, and I think schools really should and be encouraged to bring their kids up and uh, really see history in the works instead of just you know learning about it in the books. But had it, I only had two district offices. My first one was much like this building. Uh, couldn't afford very much in rent in the early days of a, of a district office. There really wasn't very much appropriated to legislators for their offices and staff, and again. You know, a desk and chair was pretty much all you get. And it was a neat old building. It was an old farmhouse in Bucks County, but I had to move because uh, just like here, it had holes in the roof and there were, there was rain falling in on my desk on rainy days and ultimately moved uh, to another building and w was there probably for uh, a good 16 years. Did you have any mentors whenever you first started in the house? Um, the, the guy that was the closest to me in age, and again, it was, it was difficult back then. Today the legislature is uh, much more reflective of a younger legislature. When I first got elected there was, I was 26 years old, there was only a handful of us, four or five guys that were under 30. And so the majority of people that you would interact with were older, uh, many of them older than my father. Uh, the closest in guy to me was a guy in Bucks County at the time, his name was Ed Burns, and Ed was still about 12 or 14 years my senior. But compared to the rest of the guys, 
I, I, I look at it this way. Ed, Ed Burns, he um, actually was in the Korean War and was a helicopter pilot, was shot down actually, and was a POW. Went back to Bucks, became a teacher, and then got elected to the House. The other guys from Bucks, they were in World War II. So when you look at the age, uh, you know, I had the Vietnam War because my number w was pulled in the draft, but it was too high, so I didn't have to go. Ed was Korean, and the other, the other guys from Bucks served in World War II. So he was the closest in age and uh, sat next to him his, the balance of his time here. And uh, we had a good time, and he, he helped me out a lot. And I used that to help out incoming guys as they came through and got elected from Bucks County as well. Well, who did you help? Um, well, we had we had a long long list. Uh, you know, back when I when there was myself and uh, Jim Greenwood, who ultimately went on to Congress, that were uh, the young guys from Bucks County. And from then on, uh, you had uh, you know, guys like uh, Tommy Thomason got elected, and Dave Heckler got elected, Joe Conti. All three of those guys went on to the Senate. And then there's just been a, a, all the current House guys have all gone through there. You can go backwards from, you know, McElhenney and uh, my predecessor, the, the person that took after me, Scott Petrie, Bernie O'Neill, all these guys, Kathy Watson, all these people came in after, and uh, Matt Wright, and uh, are still there. But uh, you know, one of the things that, that I realized unfortunately when I got elected, there wasn't anything there, and there wasn't anybody here when you got elected to help you. You just was shown your office and uh, said, go ahead. And so I had always had a lot of things that I did that over trial and error w would work as far as ways to write or different types of letterhead or, or just how to organize and how to get your office organized and how to, how to handle incoming mail or, or whatever. And I put packets together and uh, it would be like an orientation thing when any new member got elected. And I, a lot of guys, you know, they appreciate it. And they're, it's, they're still in use, so it's, it's kind of interesting. Could you tell us about some of the activities you per participated in outside of the house? Well, my, my passion right now, besides my family, my wife, etc., cetera, is, uh, is golf. And uh, the, I guess the greatest thing other, outside of legis the legislature that, that the legislature brought to me was the ability to play golf. When I first got elected again, you have a lot of idle time on your hands. And I was 26. Four years later, you know, it was around 30. I, someone asked me to go play golf, and you know, I just never did before. So uh, it was it was a little brutal at first, uh, but I've stayed with it and worked hard on it, and uh, knocked myself down to like a six handicap right now. And uh, but it, it's really uh, back then I liked to ski. Uh, today, you know, I don't ski at all because it's too cold. You know, so it's changed changed a lot of things around, but. Uh, the other thing that was an important activity, and it's not really an activity, but in, the legislature actually uh, introduced me to my wife. So through that process, uh, you know, we met and uh, you know, got married, and the rest is history there as well. Can you explain the role of camaraderie through inter intra caucus, inter caucus, and sure. individual relationships? Sure. I mean, this is this. Uh, you're surrounded by, you know, basically 253 people up here besides staff. So it's it's a, l a large concentration, and you know as a legislator you're you're pretty much the the king of your own domain, and, you know at least with inside your own office, and it's it's just natural you spend so much time together that you're going to start talking to people and you get friendly with people. You're you're appointed to certain committees and then you get to know those guys a little bit better. It's a shame that uh, when people watch, you know PCN or anything that covers the house. You're going to see it looks like bedlam because people are walking. It doesn't look like anybody's paying attention. There's talking going on and all that. But unfortunately, that's the largest room in the Capitol. It's the only place that you really, a lot of times, can get to see people and actually talk to them about either legislation you're working on or other things that you're interested in. And uh, you know, it's really pretty constructive. But uh, I've had some really good friendships that, that started from here. I'm still in touch with uh, a lot of the guys that I had served with, uh, even though I've been out now for almost four years. And um, you know, it, it, you don't trade those in for anything, but it is a little bit different than, than the real world of the private sector because, uh, again, today you have the best technology, you have the best staff, you have cutting edge of whatever you need. There's nothing that if you need to, to make your job and enhance your job to do it better, to communicate better with your constituents, et cetera, that you can't 
get instantaneously also research. I mean, the research arm here is outrageous. If you, if you have an interest in doing anything, you can be talking to experts within, you know, hours. And, uh, you know, you don't have to go out and find a consultant and pay someone to do this kind of stuff. It's there. It's, it's provided for you. So th the legislature today is really well prepared to do the work that they're doing. You served on several committees while you were a member of the House. Um, insurance your entire career, Correct. obviously. <laughs> uh, conservation from 1983 to 90. Finance from 1989 to 1992. Business and economic development from 93 to 96. Could you describe some of the important issues or aspects of your committee work throughout your tenure? Sure. Well, insurance was important to me because, again, I was, uh, I was, I was an insurance agent, still was during my time here. I was the only practicing insurance agent in the legislature, and that probably tells you something. There weren't any there weren't any insurance agents, and there weren't any doctors, and there weren't any dentists, there weren't any nurses, and they probably all realized the same thing. Why would you want to go up there and do that when you could be in your profession? But um, I represent, and, and professionally, I represent the interests of my policyholder. You know, not not the insurance company, but actually the consumer. And that was always a position that I had taken in the insurance committee. I always looked at it from the consumer standpoint. So um, there was a number of things over those 20 years, I mean, that we did you know, that to explain a lot of it is a little bit boring. But one of the, I think, the key things that I did is I put in a protection into the law now on insurance companies from being able to rate surcharge you or increase your rates after an accident. They're allowed to do it, but uh, what would happen in the past, they would never consider your deductible. And very often someone would have a $500 or $1,000 deductible, and the claim would be less than the deductible, but they would still receive a surcharge. And uh, I just didn't think that was right. And a lot of times people wouldn't turn in a claim, but the, the claim would still be on their record because there would be a police report. And the insurance company could use that, if you have two within a three-year period, to cancel your insurance. And again, I didn't think that was fair. So we, we created a dollar limit and said that, that, that the claim had to be over that dollar limit as well as a deductible for them to surcharge. And that deductible was tied to an inflation that the insurance department has to adjust every two years. So um, it's providing a, a large amount of protection today. When we first started, it was, it was $500 in excess of your deductible. So again, if you had a $500 deductible, if a claim was under $1,000, they couldn't charge you a surcharge. Today, the surcharge is uh, like $1,250 over top of your deductible. So when you look at it, you're really you know, getting a sizable amount of protection. And again, the key was we didn't want to have people just lose their insurance over, over a small accident. And again, that's why you buy insurance in the first place. But you know, there were a lot of things we did otherwise through insurance, but you know, a lot of it is uh, more, more jargon than, than of uh, exciting issues. Did you have a favorite committee? My favorite committee were the two that I chaired. I was chairman originally of uh, Urban Affairs, which is kind of funny for a suburban guy. Uh, but it, it worked out great for me because Philadelphia was so close. Uh, back then, uh, Governor Rendell was mayor, so uh, we would interact a lot with the city of Philadelphia. We did a lot of meetings and, and met with the governor, or with the mayor at that time, a number of times on issues that were important to the city of Philadelphia. Um, and, you know, I. I think as a suburban guy, I was a pretty good steward of the urban issues and, uh, you know, trying to do what we can statewide to help our, our cities, not just Philadelphia, but Pittsburgh and the other small uh, third class type cities that we have in the state to, to get their economies and, and make them uh, have enterprise zones and things like that that would really help them attract and grow business in their area and get more people to come to the downtown. And that's really what our, our whole our, our whole focus was trying to get the cities to attract people to want to live there instead of having the cities be places people want to flee. And uh, there's, you know, you're seeing a, a huge reversal in that now in the city of Philadelphia. Um, the young kids that move, get their first job, they want to live in the city. That's where the nightlife is, that's where the restaurants are, that's, that's where the people are. Um, and again, as they grow older, get married, have children, it's natural they're going to want to move out to uh, the suburbs, and that's great too. But it, but both are thriving at this point, which is great. But the uh, the second committee I chair was the Liquor Control Committee, and um, Pennsylvania, whether you like it or not, has a, a, an old old system of dealing with the the way we retail alcohol, and it goes all the way back to the end of Depression. 
And when depression, when the, not the depression, I'm sorry, with prohibition, when prohibition ended, uh, the United States government just turned to the states and said, listen, you guys, state by state, can decide how you want to handle the issue of alcohol sales in your state. Pennsylvania basically created a system that's still in place to this day, the Liquor Control Board. And um, what we do is uh, our Liquor Control Committee actually deals with all legislation that affects liquor sales in Pennsylvania, and the board obviously would enforce those laws. And um, w again, state stores have come a long way. When I turned 21, Pennsylvania's uh, liquor stores were a counter store. You would walk up to a counter. There was nothing out that you could look at. Everything was on shelves behind the counter, and you had a, a big atlas in front of you, and you could pick what you wanted, but that was it. You couldn't browse. Stores later went on to become a little bit more user-friendly, but they still uh, were lacking in selection. And um, one of the, my goals as Chairman of the Liquor Tr Control Committee was to make Pennsylvania a better place for the consumer, uh, knowing that um, you know, Governor Thornburg tried uh, many times uh, to deal with uh, breaking up the liquor store system. Uh, Governor Ridge tried to privatize the system. Uh, knowing that that was you know, a, a, a tough road to hoe, uh, what we wanted to do is at least enhance the system you know, with what we have and uh, make it better for the consumers. And I think if you've seen the stores now, um, the fact that you can buy corkscrews, the fact that there's gift bags, all of that goes all back to our legislation that allowed, through statute, the Liquor Control Board to actually do these things. You can now buy wine glasses in our stores, but you know that was all an enhancement of of upgrading the stores. Then you know the major one of the major issues was when we upgraded the hours, because uh, uh, Pennsylvania stores were only open uh, six days a week, and the second largest shopping day of the year of the month in the week is Sunday and uh, the stores were closed on Sunday so there was an epic battle to pass uh, legislation of mine that would allow stores to be open on Sunday and uh, it, it took a number of hits and a number of tries but uh, ultimately we were successful and the Sunday sales has been extremely successful and profitable to the state as well as really good to the consumer because again you, you plan your Sunday meal not always on Friday and that bottle of wine you'd love to get, uh, you know, not always could you. And we certainly wanted our people to do it the, the legal way. I mean, Pennsylvania is surrounded by a number of states that are all open on Sunday. So uh, Bucks County is bordered by New Jersey. Uh, our stores are local. I live 10 minutes away from the Jersey border. I mean, I wanted something available for us in our own state. And so Sunday sales was very successful. Why was it so hard to open it up? It, uh, who, who was against it? This is, you know, the, this is a Quaker state, not, not by religion, but by history. And um, there were a lot of religious ish people, the issues that were concerned about alcohol on Sunday. There were people that just uh, thought it was a tradition. There were other people who, if they could, legislators that they could, would welcome prohibition again. Uh, there were people that were trying to falsely protect children from underage drinking. Well, nobody goes in the state stores in Pennsylvania underage and gets served. I don't care if it's Saturday, Tuesday, or Sunday. And uh, it was it was just it was a it was a new concept. Uh, it was uh, it was something where even the people that supported it weren't sure how to gauge it because you weren't sure how your own constituents were going to react. We didn't have polls on it. You know, we didn't have you know censuses that were done. It was just the right thing to do at the right time and uh, you know it was a battle it, it, it failed by a, a vote it came back and got passed by a vote then it got reconsidered and failed by a vote and and it ultimately got passed by uh, one or two votes and uh, went on to be passed in the Senate and signed in the law but since then uh, the issue became such a powerful one that for the consumers that the people of Pennsylvania were such so verbally in support of the convenience that the legislature now has also changed the store hours for beer wholesalers and now you can buy both beer and wine in Pennsylvania on Sunday. I think another issue um, with this, the state liquor stores was uh, the sale of wine on the internet and you were involved in that as well. That's right. That was a, that was a separate issue but they kind of ran in the legislature at the same time. Um, again, 
the wine selection in, in Pennsylvania you know, had been criticized historically for a number of years. Uh, there are now some really upscale state wine and spirit shops, uh, although not all stores are, but when you find one of those, you can really find a lot of great, really interesting wines. Uh, Chairman Newman of the LCB has done a lot on things called Chairman Specials to kind of promote some of these wines where they buy large lots of odd lots of wines from all over the world and, and moderately price them. But even so, there's still wines that you can't get in Pennsylvania and uh, you could, for instance, go on the internet uh, t to, the, to the vineyard directly and, and buy them direct. Uh, but in Pennsylvania, it was against the law. So what we wanted to do is say, if the wine's sold basically in Pennsylvania, then you gotta buy it in Pennsylvania. But the wine's not sold in Pennsylvania, we wanna have our residents have a way to legally buy wine that is you know, easy, easy to come by. You don't necessarily need a wine broker to get it. You can simply go out and, you know, you find a vineyard. They all have they all have wine clubs. You could join all these things, which would be great. But the caveat was the law pro prohibited you from doing it legally. A lot of people have done it anyway. Uh, a lot of people have uh, work in New Jersey and have it shipped to where they work. But we wanted to give an outlet for people to actually uh, go out and bring wine in that they they'd like that they. A lot of people have gone to Napa Valley and Sonoma and they did wine tastings and they found great wines and they come home and they can't buy it. So this is what we were going after and uh, fortunately that was passed as well and now the consumers have the ability to do that and uh, it's a real simple process. Uh, could you talk about the State Swimming Pool Safety Act and what were the issues in, in regard to that? As I mentioned previously, I was a lifeguard and uh, to me water and safety was always an issue. Uh, you know, it, over six years that I was on the beach patrol, thousands and thousands of people were in front of me, and it was, it was a, a, an awesome responsibility. But Pennsylvania had a, a horrible statistic that uh, over 30 children a year drowned in back, backyard swimming pools. And to me, I always thought that uh, most municipalities had a pool ordinance, mine did. Uh, the, the municipality I, that I lived in had an ordinance that had said you had to have a, a fence of a certain size and the safety equipment, et cetera. But when I looked into the issue of why there were still so many drownings in Pennsylvania of young children, I realized that basically half the municipalities in Pennsylvania did not have any kind of local pool, pool ordinance for some reason. And a lot of that is, you know, you know, government intervention and people don't like mandates, they don't like the, their township or the local borough government to tell them they have to do something and and the political will for whatever reason wasn't there and uh, children I, in my opinion were in jeopardy and so you know I went on a quest and it was a long process to, to, to ultimately come to uh, a bill that was passed in Pennsylvania it took um, even among supporters it took a lot of a lot of people a lot of effort to basically say to their municipality that if you don't pass your own ordinance, we're going to mandate this state code on you. And that's actually what we did. We created a, uh, the, the difficulty with anything when you put it into law is that if, if things change, technology changes, if there's a better way to do it, if you put it in a statute one way, it doesn't get the advantage of that. So what we did is we created a basic standard and then we tied it to the Boca Code, which governs all types of development. Boca Code actually has a section on swimming pools. So what happens is our statute has this basic fencing requirement, height, the way the slats of the fence have to be, and then we tie it also to the current Boca Code, so it's both. So that code, as that continues to enhance over time, you know, and it's been time already since it's been passed, it keeps it getting improved along the way. So it's kind of a unique way that we did that law. And uh, you know, you're still gonna see uh, drownings occur in Pennsylvania, and there's, there's a whole lot of reasons for it. Um, none of them, no bill that we pass, no law that's gonna be in place is ever gonna take away parental oversight. You know, if you have a child and they're in the water, you need to be there. If you have a pool and you have children, that pool needs to be off base unless you are there. And pool covers have come a long way. There are pool covers that uh, many adults can stand on and it doesn't cave. That, you're gonna have a pool, that's the type of cover you should have. Um, 
there was sad cases where people had pool covers, but a young child walks on the pool cover and a little inch of rain that was sitting on that pool cover when the child's weight gets to it all turns into a, you know, a, a, a foot or, long, or more. Child's on a slippery surface and drowns on top of the pool cover. So you, you have a pool, you have an awesome responsibility, but um, you know, we're not going to stop it, but we think the, the, the pool legislation that was passed has gone a long way to uh, help protect children in Pennsylvania. Could you tell us how the idea came about for the Community Trust Fund Act? The Community Trust Fund is, uh, is a piece of legislation that, I, boy, this, this was probably the longest piece of legislation that I ever had in work in progress to ultimately get passed in the law. I actually started it my second term, and it was the last thing I passed in my 20th year. And I tried every single year to get it through the legislature. But what it what had happened is uh, in my second term, a, a guy I know came up to me and said, you know, I'm really concerned. I have a retarded daughter. And I'm taking care of her myself. I don't need any government help or intervention. I don't need any support. And, you know, I have provided life insurance and all for her after I'm gone. He goes, but the worry I have is all of the federal aid and programs that would take care of her as a dependent when I'm gone all have income tied, limitations tied to it. So if I do the right thing as a parent and provide for her after I'm gone, I'm now going to exclude her from state and federal aid that's set up to take care of children when their parents are gone. So it seemed like it was a catch-22. You couldn't do the right thing. Uh, if you were, if you wanted to do the right thing, you did nothing, and you let the child be destitute, and then everybody steps in. But uh, what we wanted to do is create a way for a parent to actually do that. And what we ultimately did is we, we said the assets that they have, that they want to title to the child, they would title to a trust. The trust then would dedicate that those funds would be directed towards that child's care. And, and things from televisions to you know, cosmetics, you know, anything that could improve their quality of life along with their, their living standards and, their, and, we're, and their, whatever they need for their, subs, you know, their food and, and uh, whatnot. But we, the second component was that when the money was donated to the trust and when that child ultimately as an adult someday dies, those monies then would, any monies that were left over would be used to bring in other children who didn't have those resources to also provide those better qualities for their life as they go through. And um, I mean, it was something that everybody said, oh yeah, it sounds great, but you know, how are you going to do that? And uh, it took extensive work. Uh, I, I went through probably seven different executive directors of the Health and Human Service Committee to ultimately work on this. But uh, I'm happy to say it, it's in place, and anybody that has uh, any, a child with any type, and it's not any one malady, but any type of a malady now has the ability to actually provide in, after their death for their child's health and well-being and knowing that it's not going to put them in any jeopardy, and then also knowing that they're going to help other children along the way. Can you tell me what role seniority plays in the House? Seniority is, uh, outside of leadership, seniority is everything. And up until only recently, it's only been a recent trend where leaders have been elected that really weren't mainly the more senior members. Uh, but basically, uh, it's, it's, it's much like uh, any armed services. It's much like, uh, you know, even, again, as a lifeguard, you know, every year you're in, you've got a little bit more status. You get to pick where, which beach you want to be at. Same thing here, you get elected. Uh, seniority and majority are the two key words in the legislature. Um, when I got elected as a Republican, the, the House had just turned from Republican to Democrat. So in my case, I got elected and served my first 12 years in minority. As a minority member, you really have legislatively very little opportunity to, to do a lot other than you know, looking at bills as, as they're coming over from the Senate and trying to see what you can add successfully in the amendment. And uh, I, was, 
I was lucky in, in 20 years of legislature, I passed over 22 pieces of legislation. So, you know, in my early days, I used that uh, amendment process in order to, to, to get the issues that were important to my district into play and before the House and then ultimately get before the governor for signature. Um, but seniority also really is important because your first office to your staff to how much staff you have, um, you know, was all a pecking order. And back again, uh, going back 20 years ago, uh, if you weren't like the leader, uh, everybody else was pretty much the same. It didn't matter if you're a rank and file or you're a committee chairman. Uh, there wasn't really a whole lot to do in Harrisburg. But if people come up and visit Harrisburg today, they're going to see a different kind of city than we saw when we first came up here. There were very few places to eat. There was very little things to do. The um, city really wasn't very attractive. And um, a former House member, Steve Reed, ultimately left the legislature and has become the mayor of Harrisburg. He's been there for 20 plus years and has been responsible for a lot of the turnaround in Harrisburg. But uh, over that period of time, members would uh, hitch up with each other and we'd drive out to some place and have dinner together. And there was a lot of that going on, uh, a lot of camaraderie back then. But as the legislature changed, it became more professional. Um, you had the, uh, the opportunity f where seniority wasn't playing as much. Everybody got kind of, you all had your desks and you all had your staff and everything became a little bit more uh, upgraded and professional. And, uh, I, you know, I think it's, it's a good thing. You don't really have to fight for your desk space anymore. Uh, it's still seniority from your committees on down. Uh, it's still seniority by whether you become a chairman or not. So your tenure here definitely comes into play. And if you're here long enough, uh, you, you get, I think, I think it's rewarded, but not rewarded by your leader. You just get the opportunity as a chairman to actually make things happen. It's your schedule. You, you set the agenda. You, you tell your committee what's important. Um, it's like a little business. You run it the way you want to have it run. You have staff that are there to help you move an agenda or the agendas that you like and your interaction with the minority is 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 up to you i, I was very fortunate that uh, i had uh, good members that have served on both my committees republican and democrat and it was evident when i left urban affairs to take on liquor control that uh, members on both r and d followed me over to to liquor control because they just continued to want to be on the committees that i was chairing so you know, that made me feel real good and uh, I feel like we did a lot of positive things and, uh, you know, helped the members as well. What aspect of your job as a House member did you enjoy the most? I liked the ride here and back because, uh, again, uh, we're going to uh, the days without cell phones. But it was a real quiet time and it was a period of time for me. It was a two-hour commute. It wasn't, wasn't a horrible commute. It was, uh, I got on the turnpike and once, like I guess I said, once you get past Valley Forge, it was just beautiful terrain and, and uh, it, was, it was a great drive. I, I enjoyed the solitude away, uh, you know, over the years I had a, a young child, uh, young child's now 23 years old, but, you know, I got to get away from a crying baby occasionally and, and have quiet in the car and that was good. I, uh, I listened to music, I did books on tape uh, when they came out. Earlier than that I was doing language tapes. Anything to just kind of, you know, give yourself some quiet time. So the, the drive here and back was great. And, uh, you know, then when you get up here, you'll you have a couple of friends that, that are members that you like to be around. And it was always nice to see everybody because after a week or a couple of weeks, if we had a recess, it's nice to see your friends back again. What aspect did you like the least? Again, I think the least was just the way, unfortunately, the legislative process is. Um, we're supposed to start at 11 o'clock and uh, for whatever reason it, it gets delayed and uh, so you're ready to, you're ready you're you planned your day you have you have meetings that are set up you have schedules that you have told people that you would be available for and all of a sudden the legislative schedule changes because either a bill in printing hasn't gotten out yet or a committee hasn't reported out its bill or whatever the process and uh, it's it's that hurry up and wait and uh, just sitting around waiting to do the, the business of the state was uh, a, a, a real down to me. I mean, it, it would have been fine if I only served here for four years, 
But after 20 years, you had enough of idle time. And, and if, I, if there was a way to calculate how many hours I spent waiting for the legislature to convene so we could actually do what we were scheduled to do, uh, there's lost years there. Was there an informal caucus for, for the people of your area? Um, was there a Bucks County delegation? The delegation was there. It was, it was loose. Today, there's, it's much more organized. Today, there's a caucus almost for everything, a little sub-caucus for anything. Um, but it was, it was just kind of a, a very loose group back then. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of structure to things. And, uh, and again, because mainly, it didn't matter if you, here, if you were here for one term or five terms. You weren't, a, you weren't a leader, you weren't senior enough to do anything. Uh, and, and so everybody just kind of hung together and you know, the, there were softball leagues that some guys played in and there was ice hockey leagues. That, again, there was a lot of idle time up here. It's, uh, when you're away from your family for three days, I think a lot of people don't realize the time legislature spends away from home. Uh, again, for me, two hours I could get back home on any given night if I had to. But if you're coming from the western part of the state or the northwestern part of the state, you have over a six-hour drive. It's, it's, it's difficult to do. So a lot of these guys have to come in a day early. They leave a day late. Uh, you're away from your family a lot. And uh, you know, I never had an interest in hanging out in restaurants and bars. So it was nice to have uh, other, other things that could take up your time. Again, the city didn't have a real nightlife. So uh, you kind of had to fend, fend for yourself. And uh, again, I said golf. Was made it for me, but other guys found other things. There were there were legislators here that liked to draw, and they 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 did art. There you see a lot of guys that had bikes, and they would go biking along the river or some run. They had all different interests to kind of give them downtime while you're up here, because it, it is you know you you would spend as much time here. Many of these guys spend more time here than in their own home districts because they had to travel so far. Did you have one fondest memory of serving? I th you know, I, I, I'd have to say meeting my wife. That would be a very difficult thing to overlook. But legislative-wise, I, I think it was, um, you know, I was really lucky that I got in young and retired after 20 years on my own uh, with my own decision to get out and when it was right for me and uh, retired with uh, a lot of people, you know, thanking me for service, wishing I was still there. I got, got a lot of letters and notes and calls from constituents as well as members saying, you know, it was great having, having you there. And those kind of things are really like a nice feedback. You, you always hope you're doing the right job. You always think you're doing the right thing. But, you know, that kind of feedback was, was great. Um, I mean, that's, that's a pretty fond memory. You're, you have, a, you know, you have your memoir to an extent. There's a legislative history now, like what we're doing today, your archives. Uh, where this stuff is protected into the future and it's always going to be there. Um, it's nice that your record is out there and will be preserved and uh, you know it, it again it was lucky enough for me I have had four years and I have hopefully many more to look back on things that I did that today are really making a difference and we've talked about a number of them there's a plethora more but you know I know it's made Pennsylvania a better place so that that's probably outside of meeting my wife, the most rewarding. What would you say was the hardest issue you encountered as a representative? Boy, you know, there, there were quite a number of issues. The hardest issue is when you get an issue, you know, I, I, without being specific, I can tell you what really the position you're in. When you're a legislator and you feel one way and the majority of people in your district feel the other, that's a real squeeze. And, and it happens. Um, I can remember a lot of times that I, you know, I said, listen, I got elected based on, you know, I want to do three things. I want to, first, I represent my legislative district, second, I represent my county, and third, I represent all the people of Pennsylvania. But, you know, you still have your own convictions that you have to be true to. And a lot of times, something of the day may seem like the hot thing, we should do it. But you know, if, if you don't believe that's right, um, I just had a hard time saying, well, I can support that. And there were, there were times where you know, I actually went the other way than the majority of people in my district might have thought was the right vote. And I would vote the, the way I think, you know, based on my, my morals and conviction, what is right. And um, fortunately, you know, I never had a problem with elections because of it. But that's probably the biggest 
quandary test, whatever you want to call it, that, that a, a new legislator has to deal with. How am I going to, how am I going to deal with an issue? Am I going to be a barometer for the people, what they think, and be a populist? Or am I going to be, you elected me to do a job, I've looked at this, I've studied this issue, this is what I think is best for the masses. And again, they're not all the same. What's good for my district isn't always good for the county and vice versa, and what's good for Bucks isn't always good for Pennsylvania. And uh, you know, you've got to make those, those tough calls. And uh, you know, there are examples you know, all the way through where you know, the same situation was, I didn't, re I didn't do what the people maybe wanted in my district. I didn't represent necessarily entirely what the people of Bucks County might have wanted in an issue or what people in Pennsylvania might have wanted. But I thought it was the right thing to do. And so that would be the moral test that I used. How would you like to be remembered? You know, I, I was, um, I was, I was kind of legislature. I was the kind of legislator that um, was, who would walk into the restaurant and hopefully wouldn't be identified. You know, hopefully I could go hang around, just be normal. Um, I, I, you know, I answered my own phone when someone would call. I'd say, just call me Roy. I'd never signed a letter with my last name. You know, I just wanted to be just, you know, like everybody else. Again being the fact that I was also working, felt, you know, a little closer to it. Um, but if, some, if someone starts throwing your title around, the first thing I'd say, oh, just call me Roy. And uh, I, I think I want to be, you know, I, besides legislatively, I'd like to be remembered as someone that just, you know, cared and, and, and was just like everybody else, just someone that uh, wasn't pretentious, uh, you know, didn't, didn't, you know, walk around, you know, a few feet higher than the rest. and. Uh, you know, I think I think it's worked out. I um, I was involved in a lot of things uh, here. It was nice to retire from here and go back to work full time because working full time in one job versus working part time in two, this seems like semi retirement now compared to what I had when I was doing both. And uh, it's it's been nice. It's been really relaxing. But again, I think the the, the key for me was, you know, I own a business, so it was, I was able to come up here. I was able to leave here and and go back to my my company, and I always had support there to make it be the time I could spend the right amount of time here. Uh, but I was also able to get in early and get out early. I mean, it, there's a real there's a real key to being, you know, still you know, at my age I'm 51, but still having, you know, hopefully a lot of years ahead of me and knowing my 20 years uh, of, of state service, another three years, three and a half years of local service you know, are over. And, uh, you know, I, I think I left it better than when I got there. Well, in addition to your still full-time job as, uh, with your company, what are you, else are you doing these days? Well, legislatively, uh, obviously not in the legislature, but I'm still, um, I, w I was appointed by Governor Schweiker uh, to the uh, FIA board, the Pennsylvania Higher Education Assistance Agency. I've been serving on that for four years. It gets me back to Harrisburg about two, three days a, a month, which is just fine. Gives me time to meet up with with all my old buds that are still here and guys that are still in the legislature, and get to stop by and say hello to them. Um, I'm on their executive committee, so that helps. And um, there's a FIA Foundation uh, board that I'm also on. So, you know, it, it keeps my hand in it. I, I, I serve the majority of those board members are acting members of the House and Senate, so I, you know, I still stay in touch. My wife uh, is actually a lobbyist in Harrisburg. Uh, she's been a lobbyist for 20-some years. So, you know, we still have our political conversations, and, you know, I can still let her know from a legislative standpoint how, you know, how I would feel. And uh, so all, all that is great. You know, it, it, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. I, I've always had an interest in politics. Again, I was a political science major in school. I, I actively, you know, still still read uh, the clips and what's going on, and have a have an, a pretty good idea of what's it's on. I still have my opinions, and a lot of times the legislature goes in ways that, you know, if I said if I was still here, I wouldn't vote that way. But uh, you know, that's just the way it's going to be. You're you're not going to be able to have 253 people working on something and have a 100 percent consensus consensus agreement. And you're not always going to have, you know, a husband and wife don't agree on every issue, and uh, you're certainly not going to have political parties agree on every issue, and you're not going to have constituents or the people of Pennsylvania always agree with everything you do. But uh, again, that moral compass, if it's on the right 
point in the right direction and you use that, it should be a good barometer, you should do just fine. Lastly, do you have any advice for new members? It's a different legislature, it's a different constituency today. Um, there was a time, you know, when I first got elected, uh, that someone may not have liked the individual member, but there was a lot of respect for the office. Uh, same thing federally, uh, your congressman and the president, uh, those offices were always an office of respect. Um, you may not have liked who was serving presently, but you would always be respectful. I think if there's one thing that I've seen constantly be eroded over the last 25 years is the, the climate of the constituent, the voter. Um, voting, everything, everything involved with that climate is hurting the numbers and the voters because the number of people that show up to vote in primaries in general have been just decreasing year after year. You're getting less and less people interested and involved. If they're not involved and interested enough to vote, you're going to have a hard time getting quality people that are going to want to be interested and involved in running, that, whether it be for local offices, school board, whether it be for your, your township, or your city, or your borough councils. And if you don't have people interested in that level, then you don't have really people ready to be interested in serving in the state and, the, and in the Congress. And, and I just think the tenor of campaigns have gotten to a point that uh, you know, it disgusts everybody. And I, I'm just fearful that it's just going to continue to have you know, politics as normal. Uh, it, it just shouldn't be that way. I mean, you should be able to uh, agree or disagree with someone's position, but still do it in a respectful manner. And if there's one thing that I'd like to see and the federal and state and local campaigns is a change. I'd like to see the constituents and the voters say, I'm not going to put up with those type of campaigns anymore. You know, I'm going to vote you, I'm going to vote no on you if you run a negative campaign. If you're, talk, if you're not running an issue or in a campaign, you're not going to get my vote. And I think if you do that, you'll have a lot more interest in voting. You know, I, I spoke to uh, all the fourth grades and schools in my district for all the 20 years I was in. That's when they do state government. Kids are overly enthusiastic about government and voting, the process, and how it all works in fourth grade. Something happens between fourth grade and 18 years of age where they just have an interest. They don't have that interest any longer. It's hard to get them to register to vote. It's impossible to get, you know, the younger voters out to the polls. And, uh, you know, the senior citizens of the day, you know, people my age and older are the ones that are showing up. But you, you, know, you, need, a, you need the diversity even at the, in the polls in order to have the right candidates elected and to represent the masses. So that's the one area I think I'd love to see a change. Thank you very much. This concludes our interview today. Well, thank you very much for having me. Is that okay? Perfect. Okay.